Hello, Partnering for Vaccine Equity Learning Committee members and others working on vaccine equity. Welcome to this afternoon's learning event entitled Incentives for Vaccinations, What Does the Evidence Show? My name is Jenny Haley. On behalf of our team at the Urban Institute, thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're going to hear from three great speakers. They will provide an overview of the evidence on incentives for health behaviors, including vaccinations. They're going to discuss what works and what doesn't, and talk about how some of the different subgroups of the population might respond to incentives for vaccinations. So we're in for a very interesting discussion. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to do our typical quick review of how the session will work. You've all been muted upon entry to the session. There are a lot of us, so staying on mute unless you're speaking is key to keeping the discussion going without accidental interruptions. And after the presentations, we'll reserve some time for Q&A. If you want to type your question, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to do this. And you can ask a question at any point during the session. Uh, you do have the opportunity to speak your question if you'd prefer, it's your choice. And if you'd like to do that, then during the Q&A, you can use the raise hand feature and we'll unmute you. The chat room feature is also open today and we encourage you to chat amongst yourselves as you'd like. But of course, please use good chat room etiquette. We don't recommend that you post questions for the speakers in chat in case they don't see them there. Uh, of course, this goes without saying, but please be civil to one another and to our speakers while you're chatting. Specifically today in the chat, I'd like to extend an invitation for learning community members and other partners to share in the chat if you've used incentives in your uh, vaccine programs, what was the incentive and who got it and how was the response? And uh, I hope that that will be interesting to everyone to see in the chat. We have also begun offering live interpretation from English to Spanish during our events. If you would like to listen to the Spanish language channel, simply click on the globe icon in the Zoom taskbar at the bottom of your screen. And finally, as with all of our learning events, we will post the slides and a recording of this event on our community website and circulate them through the digests that go out through the CDC managed adult VAX program listserv, which all members should be a part of. If you have technical difficulties at any point during the session, send an email to our community man manager's inbox, vaxequitylearning at urban.org. We'll be watching the inbox and we'll try to help you as quickly as we can. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our featured speakers. First, we'll be hearing from Dr. Tracy Wharton, who is a member of the Evidence to Action team at the National Network of Public Health Institutes, or NNPHI, previously an associate professor of social work and medicine at the University of Central Florida. She's also a licensed clinical social worker with advanced training in trauma, immigration and well being, geriatrics, and end of life. Dr. Michael Gutter is the Associate Dean for Extension and State Program Leader for 4-H Youth Development, Families and Communities for the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Florida. His BS is in Family Financial Management and his PhD is in Family Resource Management from The Ohio State University with a specialization in finance. His work focuses on economic disparities and their influence on healthcare outcomes and financial well-being. And third, we'll hear from Dr. Deborah Furholden, who's the Associate Dean for Public Health Integration and the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. She's also the Director of the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She's an epidemiologist and a classically trained public health professional with expertise in behavioral health equity and health disparities research. Thank you all so, so much for taking the time to speak with us this, this afternoon. And Tracy, I will hand things off to you now. If you could advance the, hi. Um, hello everyone. Um, first of all, I wanna say that if um, we are doing the simultaneous interpretation, so I do have a tendency sometimes to speak really quickly. Um, and I wasn't thinking about the terminology that I used when I put this together that we would be having live interpretation. So please, if there is anything that is unclear, or um, perhaps I could rephrase to make it a little bit more clear, um, uh, I invite you to please uh, somebody put that in the chat or let me know and I'm happy to uh, come back to that in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> I do want to quickly acknowledge 
uh, that some of my partners who helped work on, we just did our environmental scan and we're looking at the literature. So Afrida Faria and Ankit Sangavi at the Texas Health Institute uh, did a, a really wonderful job. And you'll see there's a QR code in the top right over, over here, I guess, um, of my uh, PowerPoint. That is actually the RFP. The RFP is now closed, so you can't submit to it. But if you look at Appendix B, uh, there's a little bit more information and some examples of different things um, there. And you're welcome to check that out. Next slide, please. Um, we did get uh, introduced, and so I'm not, uh, I'm just going to skip this slide. Um, go ahead, change the slide again. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am going to give a broad overview of available evidence, and um, then some. my colleagues will dig a little bit deeper into some of that detail and really get into some more specifics. So think of this one as sort of setting the stage. I promise there's a lot of words on there, but I promise I won't be reading my slides to you. I understand these will go out to you later, and so you'll have access to the references, which are at the end, and to take a better look at this. But um, I, I want to just give you sort of a broad overview of what we know um, and looking at the evidence uh, is useful because as we are approaching our own communities to sort of know what kinds of things have already been done, what kinds of things have been tried in other places with what kinds of populations and um, instead of sort of starting from the beginning every time. So it's useful sometimes to know these things. I don't think anything on this screen is gonna be much of a surprise to anyone in this room um, or on this, uh, in this webinar. Um, but especially right now, and you can see the date on this first, very first statement was 2019. So even as we were coming into the pandemic, the World Health Organization had already identified vaccine hesitancy as one of these really critical threats to global health. Um, but we often think of these things as sort of like, you know, a big, the media will talk about it like the bit, you know, vaccine hesitancy. Um, and actually it's very nuanced, particularly across different communities. The United States is an incredibly diverse country with incredibly diverse populations. And a lot of these groups have very nuanced and different reasons why they may feel differently about what's going on. There are of course, a lot of root, uh, deep roots in historical and structural inequity and racism. Um, a lot of the things that happened, we often think, you know, things that happened a while ago, like what does redlining have to do with vaccine hesitancy, but as we play forward in, in history, things like redlining had a lot to do with where people live and why they live in certain areas. And so those issues currently play out in terms of who has access, uh, what kinds of access, um, and where people access things. So all of those historical inequities that have led to these tremendous disparities in different groups really do continue to play out. There are a lot of things going on, of course, um, lots of, uh, I was going to say dog whistling, but I think it's just flat out racism that we sometimes see in social media and, and in um, all over the place. A lot of culturally insensitive um, relationships with healthcare systems, training people on cultural competencies. But really, when you're talking about so many cultures, right, and being able to be culturally humble and advancing that across all the different kinds of health professions, there's still a lot of fear out there related to immigration and accessing care services, lack of representation. So it really is important to distinguish between care hesitant or vaccine hesitant and people who are opposed. Um, those are different things. Next slide, please. Um, uh, sorry, I got stuck. There was a, a, a point at the bottom that I'll come back to in just a second, but um, I, I wanted to let you know how, I think it's important to tell you how we found things. Um, we did look in both the peer reviewed literature. So things that are published sometimes take a little bit of time to get to, to get to print. And so we also were looking for what we call gray literature, which is the stuff that's kind of hanging out out there um, that isn't necessarily in print yet. And so we did that through a lot of different approaches, um, trying to get that information. Things are happening very quickly out in the field. And so uh, people are very busy and trying to get things to publication with that publication delay can be different. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so there were some themes in the evidence in the evidence base, and one of the uh, the point that that I forgot to mention before that I do want to sort of make sure gets brought up here is that there are a lot of different kinds of issues related to barriers and reasons for distrust. I I was speaking to someone just a couple of days ago who owns a, a nail salon, and one of the challenges that she brought up 
was that she would like to go get her booster, but it's the busy season now with the holidays in her business and she doesn't have sick time. And if she closes the business, other people can't work as well. And, um, and so if she doesn't work, she doesn't get paid. So those kinds of barriers, things get really, um, can be really different for, for lots of different groups of people. And when people don't have access to sick time or to time off, that can complicate things because it's not a simple barrier to solve. Um, there were some themes in the evidence base. And so what I have here and on the next slide are some broad themes and then a couple of things that are promising practices that are recommended. Again, you can see more of the examples uh, at the QR code. Um, multifaceted, so really approaching things instead of trying one thing, we were just talking about incentives before we went live, um, incentivizing things, but also um, using community messengers, right? or um, messaging things and also bringing uh, mobile health bands for access. So multi approaches, multifaceted approaches. There's a heavy theme of community engagement that really engages people from the community, getting those voices in um, right from the start. One thing to bear in mind is um, we often hear in the media that, oh, for example, um, you know, this community is uh, hesitant uh, to do this, but actually, that places the blame on a lot of these minoritized communities for not believing or not wanting. And actually we need to remember that this is much more nuanced and much more complicated. And often there are some really good reasons why groups don't wanna trust government agencies, right? Uh, next slide, please. We also wanna frame the messages in terms of gain. So don't repeat the barriers, but frame these in terms of positive gain that will happen as we uh, take these actions when we're trying to change behavior, right? So these, uh, and an example might be something like, this is how we take care of our community or protecting one another, things like that, right? Um, again, these were more of the themes in the evidence base. So established relationships. One of the things that we have heard in this web, it, it, that you'll hear in this webinar and in other webinars, and that's come up on the learning community, is that often we think about establishing relationships when we want something to happen. And a lot of communities will say, dude, where have you been the rest of the time, right? So um, think about establishing those relationships as longer term relationships and building that support with trusted community providers, active listening, not dismissing people's concerns. And again, differentiating between under vaccinated, which is often folks like my friend at the nail salon, right? Who, um, who uh, don't, may not have access, or have access or transportation issues, um, people who are against vaccines and people who are vaccine hesitant. Those are different groups and there are different reasons underlying the way that they're approaching this. And so we really need to meet people where they're at, ask questions, don't dismiss their concerns and really take them where they are. A couple of important points here, providing access to experts um, in the communities, advocating for that paid time off, not just to get your shot, but the next day when everybody feels kind of crummy, right? To be able to have that, um, and increasing that general knowledge. Um, I'm watching the time, so <laughs> um, next slide, please. These uh, recommendations listed here are in no particular order. The numbers here are just to make it easy to reference. So these are not rank ordered. These are just six things that showed up across all of the available literature that seem to have some pretty good evidence that they work with more than one population, right? And, and again, you'll see some of these themes, right? So trusting, uh, working with community businesses, um, community health workers, building those community partnerships, meeting people where they are, going out to them instead of expecting them to come to us. Um, improving healthcare education, really making sure that community providers have good information, that they are able to access good information and training and then um, uh, and community sort of peer narratives. I keep trying to advance the slides myself. Next slide, please. A couple of points that I wanna leave you with because these are really important public health thinking points as we move forward. These ongoing relationships that I mentioned, um, really thinking about long-term relationships with uh, particularly with communities of color and systems of care that are servicing underserved groups to make sure that we're not just saying, this is what we want and here's why we're here, but that we're building relationships for this, for also in the future when we talk about, well, it's not the future anymore, talk about flu vaccines, shingles vaccines, um, pneumonia vaccines, things like that, all kinds of health relationships and we wanna build those relationships. Again, advocating for that permanent implementation 
paid sick leave job protection for people so that they can go get it. Um, and improving data collection. When we talk about data and people, um, we often lump people together. This happens a lot with, thank you. Uh, this happens a lot, particularly with um, Asian and Pacific Islander groups where we, we say, you know, AAPI, and we're talking about uh, just a crazy number of groups, right? A, a large number of, of, of groups of people. And truly Khmer and Chinese and Samoan are not the same group. And so once you begin to look at data and, and think about collecting data, that's more nuanced, that really gets at, um, that really gets at that and break that apart, that, that changes the way that we see things. Uh, improving media and digital liter literacy and then nurturing those long-term relationships in your community, making sure that experts from the community are available, that gatekeepers know how to access those and also media contacts. Next slide, please. I think this is the last one. Again, I did mention that I had some references. There are some links on here. Uh, you'll have access to these slides and feel free to reach out if I can answer questions. I'm gonna hand this off to my colleagues now. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Wharton. That was awesome. I took some notes myself. And uh, so I, I hope to add a little bit more to the, con to the conversation as well. Uh, so let me first of all add to I, I do want to in similar fashion acknowledge uh, that this all takes a teamwork of effort. Uh, I, I represent a consortium of our community, our health or pandemic project, which represents the clinical and translational sciences institute here at UF cooperative extension as well in Florida, and then also working with six other states. Uh, so I really want to thank my team members, uh, and I've listed a few on here that are really helpful in putting some of this information today, especially uh, one of the last slides, uh, Dr. Kathy Striley came through with some uh, brief kind of clips from some of our early uh, 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 surveillance work that we've been doing by just learning a little bit by uh, from our community. So uh, thanks so much to all of them, and let me um, try and cut through some things uh, as best as I can so that uh, I can maybe um, hopefully uh, build on what uh, Dr. Wharton talked a little bit about here too. So uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. So what I really wanted to touch base on here is we kind of know there's vaccine hesitancies across the board. And why I wanted to highlight this is that we see this in whether we're looking at nurses, whether we're looking at community educators and across the board. And so as we look at uh, our own vaccine hesitancies um, with those that are working with patients and community facing, depending upon where they are and what pressures they face, and thank you, Dr. Wharton, for mentioning some of the pressures and factors that influence our beliefs about some of these, uh, we find that there can be some real concerns there. Now, what's interesting, though, is that most of you are aware that whether we're looking at mandates or incentives, we know that there's going to be some mixed results to what we might think of as either the carrot or the stick side of trying to motivate individuals there too. So, and in fact, we know that many of our large organizations face challenges just like this and are trying to make decisions about how can they go about exploring this. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, you can skip this one, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so as we look at just kind of what some of we're hearing about this too, and this is touching base on influenza, and I won't spend too much time on non-COVID issues, but I do think we've got, as Dr. Wharton knows, there's a little bit more literature on some of that right now too, as we're building up this literature here. So what we do know is that there are differences in whether or not people are educated, whether or not we're providing them with information. Now, why do I point this out? Because many of us are engaged in the education business as well as parts of these aspects. And I wanted to point out, as most of us know, is that it really takes more than one piece of the puzzle to move this needle. So that while we look at incentives, we know that education and other aspects are gonna be important to really moving people on the behavior change spectrum. So educating our workforce and engaging with them and hearing what they're having to say continues to be an important part of this. And in fact, we'll talk about some of how we're learning and listening uh, is including listening from within as well as without. I appreciate that. So next slide, please. So when we think about this though, everybody really wants to focus on the voluntary. And this is always, I try and get a little interactive here as we think about this, because I'm sure some of you have had these own conversations. Why, what motivates us to want these things to be so voluntary? 
that we want people to choose to do this. This is interactive part two. Feel free to put things in the chat window. So part of what we know is that what? We think that the idea of requiring people or uh, motivating people, cajoling people is not necessarily ethical, but I would say that I'm not sure that um, they are just, I do think they're justifiable would be one thing. Uh, thank you, Shannon, absolutely. Community responsibility, increasing buy-in. We know that maybe uh, positive incentives can really help out a lot, um, but really we know that also the more we can do to get people to do this, and Dr. Wharton, that becomes the question. So at what point is something an incentive or a reward? And at what point do we start tainting the views of those who are resistant and hesitant even more so when they start seeing those types of actions? And so with each of these things, we realize we may attract one audience and potentially um, put up another barrier or thing that we might have for others. Yeah, and so Carol raises a really good point. Dr. Lemus, I'm not sure which, but I appreciate that point, Dr. Lemus. Yes, and at what point is it voluntary versus coercive? And so I want us to be thinking about these. These are issues that we're all struggling with and challenging right now, and we'd like to know. Now, I wanna point out that there's some other types of incentives that we can think about that may or may not have benefits and the jury's still out on some of these. So when we look about incentives, we often think about the financial because it's the most tangible, gift cards, money, and others. There can also be this idea of just simple opportunity and education. People may appreciate that. And lastly, I would say the opportunities too of things like social uh, incentives. Now this has a double-edged sword as we all know too, and we'll look at some of the, what little evidence there is about some pieces of this. But we know that part of this is helping people to feel that their behaviors are normed, that uh, they're getting good positive reinforcement of those behaviors because part of what we're seeing is that many times we see a lot of negative messaging and negative sentiment with some of these. So we do have to kind of think about that where we have some of these challenges. So if we could look at the next slide, for example. So Carrot, which is a smartphone app that's been there had been used incentives to encourage education about a vaccine rather than directly getting it helping people kind of find methods and mechanisms to find these vaccines using loyalty points and push notifications. So trying to think about how we motivate people to do it, the badges, if you will. Um, and we certainly know that that type of thing can help, but in the polarized society we have today, this notion of wanting to brag about it, well, we saw that a lot of people in fact didn't put on social media and were not necessarily clear at all when they'd been vaccinated. So what else can happen? Well, what happens when we start, and as Dr. Wharton said, we aren't necessarily looking at these independent. So let's look at what happened when we tried to address pertussis vaccination amongst infant caregivers. Next slide, please. So what did we see about this, right? In trying to think about the pertussis vaccine, we wanted people to understand why they might need the vaccine. Some people understood that there is a risk, but not necessarily their own risk. We know, right, that in general, the increased education of the abstracts risk and a monetary voucher just didn't have any significant effect. Um, in fact, the largest barriers, and Dr. Wharton hinted about this, and that's why I wanted to just mention this still, is that it's the barriers to receiving the vaccination that are of the biggest challenges. Uh, time and transportation, and Dr. Wharton mentioned already this idea of having time available from work or on the clock to be able to get those types of things, and that absolutely came up as one of the issues more important than the voucher. I keep pushing the advanced slide. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. So as we look then for these childhood immunizations, so let me kind of look at this here. What happens if we gave additional incentives to physicians and children? So cash bonuses and requirements for schools, for example. Well here, right, we start thinking about immunization rates we're able to increase. Immunization rates of children's two years old were able to increase. And the barriers for getting childhood immunizations began to get addressed. Next slide, please. So the Green Pass, which was one of the types of things that was done in Israel. Well, as we saw that initially, four months after the Green Pass proposition, first and full dose vaccination numbers actually increased. 
Uh, and so we know that by March 51st had, had had their first dose COVID vaccination. Now this has been met with lots of pushback, but continues to be a possible type of way to think about it, but requires enormous policy will to implement. And it's not something that necessarily can be done on its own. Next slide, please. So we also know this, and this was an interesting one, when they did study 20,500 individuals, a basic survey here, one of the interesting things that came about was a positive correlation between financial incentives and overall compliance. Now, this is important because those of us who look at some of the behavior issues, we know that there's this idea that people may be undecided, and that's different than people who are adamantly against something. And one, this particular study here, uh, Kluver et al., and I do have my reference list available, uh, did find that those who were undecided, right, that that tended to have the largest magnitude of effect when incentivized. And that's very different than those who are against it, for whom this might simply only fuel the very reasons why they're not doing it. So we know then, and continue to kind of see that, as usual, and again, forgive me for being the econ guy who always says it, the, the, the efficacy of this depends potentially on who the audience is and where they were within this content, uh, spectrum in the first place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next slide after this in the interest of time. <laughs> okay, so, um, and that other slide there is interesting. So if you do grab these slides, I do, appreciate, do encourage you to take a look at it. It looks a little bit more about the use of incentives and what's worked. I wanted to kind of point out here then different thoughts we had. So one of the things we've been doing is going out to things like regional fairs. This is uh, something called a, a large fair in North Florida, has uh, tens of thousands of people go through its doors every day. Um, we did some uh, person on the street interviews as part of which is part of our project uh, under the CDC front. Uh, funding here. And so we looked at the different things. What did people say that might make a difference when it came to incentives and mandates? And so I wanted to kind of share these. I don't want to read through them here, but some of these things are really interesting here. More vaccine mandates, um, can't do more than we have, uh, get the shot, mandate it, make it mandated for school, uh, so on and so forth. Keep giving incentives. So these are just some interesting things that we're seeing there. And so I think uh, Elizabeth, fantastic point as is made, and I wanted to thank you for saying that too, is who is giving the incentive and under what message? So thank you so much. I think that was my, uh, here's uh, some takeaway points you can peruse and uh, we can slip to that next, please. And so these are just some things to look at here, um, some takeaways from some of the literature we have. And uh, we kind of talked about these throughout. So I appreciate your time today and I will gladly turn this over to the next presenter. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks so much, Mike and Tracy for setting a really great um, stage. I wanna, um, I, I got to cheat. I sort of saw what they were gonna talk about. So I like that they both have presented a bit from the literature. I wanna kind of put the COVID vaccine specifically in a, in a landscape. Um, I'm a health equity researcher, have been my whole career. Um, and so I kind of wanna put it in a landscape because I think um, that vaccine incentives specifically for COVID vaccines may be a little contextually distinct from some other health behaviors and vaccines that we've studied um, in the past. And I, and I wanna note, and we all know this, that this whole COVID pandemic has been wrought with a whole lot of unrest. We've had some really critical seminal race and political events that have happened during this pandemic. And they really have shined a light on an inequity. Um, it's really fueled a lot of government mistrust. And that's not just in minority communities. We know one of the largest unvaccinated groups are middle-class white conservatives. Um, so different races, different groups have had different sort of um, uh, responses, but the outcome is the same. And we've got a whole lot of people who just literally have their heels dug in and are a no um, specifically for COVID vaccines. Um, so I'm gonna put it in a, in a context. Um, I'm uh, presenting on behalf of our um, partnering for vaccine equity group at the, led by the Michigan State University, but by no means are we the only people doing the work. And we are the national network to innovate for COVID-19 um, and adult vaccine equity. Next slide, please. Uh, so I've already been introduced. I'm terrible um, at social media, but I do realize uh, social media is an important aspect. Um, of how we communicate information during this pandemic. And for better or worse, a lot of people are 
um, leaning on social media. So if I say something you like, feel free, shout me out. I'm Dr. Deb for Hold It on all platforms, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. Uh, next slide. So the continuum to me looks like this. We started off with vaccine inequity. When the vaccine first rolled out, um, we had uh, major examples of doing a really poor job of getting those shots um, inequitably into the arms of people. And we also had very um, clear examples of certain communities being hit harder by the COVID pandemic uh, than other communities. And these are just a few um, examples here. I you know, just sort of took a screen grab of an article that myself and some other colleagues did looking at the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on African-Americans in many communities across the US. And then there's a couple of really great examples that showed um, also when we look at um, the vaccine rollout, it was just done very inequitably. And even though African-Americans were eligible and older African-Americans were eligible, many had access problems and barriers to getting those vaccines. And we saw some really egregious acts of people going into African-American communities who don't live in those communities, uh, getting those vaccines, I think, which only helped to fuel and further um, the mistrust that some had in the vaccine, who maybe earlier on were a yes or a maybe, and then became a no. So we started this push, next slide, to mandate equity. And we said, what we know is that our natural drift is to inequity. We said, if equity matters, it should be law. We were calling for federal mandates, and we knew that that would force states to figure it out. The feds requiring states to prove that not only they can, but that they are getting those shots in arms fairly and equitably, and that the states, if they would mandate it, it might inspire communities of practice, because there was a lot of variability, even within states. Some communities were doing a better job at equitably, equitably getting vaccine um, to some of their residents, more so than some of their neighboring counties. So the thinking is that if equity matters, it should be mandated and forced and attached to resources. And at the time, the big resource was the COVID vaccine. And then what happened is manufacturing caught up to vaccine demand because early on, demand far exceeded supply. And by the time that happened, we had hit the wall and we're now operating in a space where supply exceeds demand. So here we go with now incentives, next slide. And so we've talked about it and Mike sort of alluded to it, this notion of what are you gonna use? Are you gonna use the carrot or are you gonna use the stick? Um, and so we went from inequity and now we then moved into the carrot. And next slide, what we saw is massive efforts to incentivize people to get the vaccine. Even our own president did a national call and he said, pay them all a hundred bucks to get vaccinated. For all the people who aren't vaccinated, give them a hundred bucks. And a lot of states jumped on board with this. Uh, the mayor of New York announced that he would offer a hundred dollar incentive for anybody who was newly vaccinated. And that was the approach that the White House suggested. I say, we, we all hear this, follow the science. When you listen to what the scientists are saying and the people who really are experts in this area, I'm going to quote a colleague here, Ellen I'm sorry, Elisa Sobo, who's an anthropologist at San Diego State University, who specifically studies vaccine hesitancy. She said the payment could be an incentive, but she suggested that it was unlikely to sway every unvaccinated person. And what she said is some folks will find the offer insulting. Others will use it as proof that the vaccine is no good. And she added, there are also lots of people who will say, why not to $100? Some people who have until now been on the fence, we'll see $100 as a good reason to get off it, off it. And I think this touches on what Mike and Tracy were pointing to. A, a lot of what we know about how incentives work in prompting and promoting uh, behavioral um, actions um, is not really being applied here so much. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we've got a couple of examples of these big lotteries that were put in place. Uh, I'm in Michigan and our Ohio uh, neighbor was one of the first, if not the first state to come out with a vaccine lottery. Um, and they were raffling off a uh, $50,000 um, college scholarship and a million dollar, um, you had a, you, you know, when you got newly vaccinated, you had an opportunity to get entered into a million dollar 
um, uh, lotto. And then our governor went on TV and said, whatever Ohio can do, we can do better and we can do bigger. So she jumped up over Ohio and we had a 30 day lottery that was running for anybody who was vaccinated, had the chance to win the big million dollars at the end. And then there was a daily uh, $50,000 lottery for any newly vaccinated people. And then there was a weekly 250K lottery. The problem is the, the, the lottery in Ohio did nothing to increase the slope for vaccination. So slope is the rate of change, right? And so there was already a number of newly vaccinated people relative to the number of unvaccinated people prior to these big lotteries and other um, programs that states were implementing. And then when the, these lotteries came out, it didn't change the slope at all. It didn't um, increase um, the rate at which people were getting vaccinated. But it sounded so good. And so all of these states um, jumped on board. And in Michigan, as an example, how I know it was not effective is that 80 to 90, 85 to 90% of the people on any given day who got vaccinated didn't even sign up for the lottery. Many people didn't even know about it. So the people that it was intended to reach, it didn't reach. And many of the people who got their vaccine didn't even bother, who even knew about the lottery, didn't bother um, to sign up for the, um, for the lotteries. And so, again, we talk about leading with the science, but we really didn't let the scientists lead on this one. So, so why is it that we think most of these lotteries didn't work? Next slide. Um, again, I'm leaning on what the experts are telling us and gleaning from what we've learned from you know, you know, maybe the year and a half of, of COVID outreach and dissemination in my own community here in Genesee County in Flint. Um, David Ash at the Penn Medical Center for Healthcare Innovation, I think said it really well. And he was asked the question by the AAMC, do you support financial incentives to promote COVID-19 vaccination? And his response was, I'm pretty negative about them. I've just said incentives often work in healthcare. So you might say you're in favor of vaccines, you believe incentives work, so why is this not chocolate and peanut butter? Two great things that are better together. And he says, the reason that what we're really trying to do here is motivate people who don't wanna get vaccinated. One could take the case, right? And I love how Tracy um, uh, 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 framed this and might frame this. You know, we talk about vaccine hesitant. But there's a lot more, and I don't, I don't like the term anti-vaxxers at all. I just, I don't like it. I feel like it stigmatizes and labels people and doesn't honor their experience, but I'll use that term just because you all know what that means. Or I won't use it, let's just say this. We've got the people who are a no to the vaccine, to the COVID vaccine, they're just a no. Then we've got the people who are sort of indifferent, the people who still remain on the fence or are just generally undecided. Most of the people we're dealing with now fall in the category of they're just a no. And so financial incentives, really, if you look at what the literature shows us, are really good at helping people who are already interested in the behavior, like quitting smoking. And uh, uh, Dr. Ash goes on to say, but if someone really doesn't want to get vaccinated, I'm not sure there's an amount of money we'd be willing to offer that would also work. And if we do offer money, we might actually inflame their concerns. Someone who has a lot of distrust of the vaccine might think they'd never offer money if this was a good thing. So that approach could actually backfire. And I think that's what we're seeing. So next slide. So then we said, okay, we got what we got from the carrot. So now we're gonna try the stick. And what the stick is involved is in massive rollout of mandates. Next slide. And we have seen this all over the place. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, President Biden's mandate that's, you know, in and out of uh, 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 pause through uh, the federal OSHA office. Um, we've got, you know, New York City issued, it was one of the states who issued this sort of, you know, first round of mandates. My university has a vaccine mandate. I mean, we're, we're now literally at the stick. And so the, the, the thing I'd like to share is, and next slide, 
is a very valuable lesson that I learned from my son, Gabriel, when he was about 11 or so. He was in the eighth grade and he wanted a PlayStation in his room. And I said, and he had been struggling uh, in school that entire year. I said, Gabe, if you get straight A's, I'll get you the PlayStation. And I put the little 32 inch flat screen TV in our foyer. I put the PlayStation, I bought it the next day, put it in the foyer. He had to walk by it every day on his way in the house up to his room. And I didn't get this kid a tutor. I didn't help him. I didn't meet with his teachers. I didn't do anything special. And short version, the kid brings home straight A's. I think the, 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 the lesson to be learned here is we've got to have incentives that map on to what matters to people. We've got this myth and this idea that dangling a big carrot in front of them or giving them a lot of money will work. And when that didn't work, we started to try to force people um, to get vaccinated with these mandates. And I think for many people, it's being, it's counterproductive. Last slide, please. So what I would offer is that many of the mainstream narratives, uh, point number one, uh, and the strategies that we're using are counterproductive and fueling confirmation bias. If one thinks that the vaccine is unsafe, it's bad for them, they're gonna get microchipped, magnetized or whatever. And then we start dangling these big incentives in front of them. I think it causes them to further dig their heels in on no. Next point is there's a heightened need for trusted and credible messengers, specifically I think for the COVID vaccines. We have to put this in a context. And remember, we called this thing Operation Warp Speed. You know, a lot of people heard warp speed and heard quick and dirty. I talk, and I've done three live sessions with Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, who is one of the developers of the mRNA technology that was used for the Moderna vaccine. And the majority of her family, she says, remains unvaccinated and are still asking her questions. Can you imagine being a developer of the COVID vaccine and having your own family not trust that the vaccine is safe and effective and being willing to get those shots in arms? The next point, I think the current messaging, a lot of misinformation and non-evidence-based strategies, the way that we've used incentives to get the shots in arms will likely further complicate the effectiveness of known evidence-based strategies that we have used successfully in the past to increase other vaccinations and that we could be using for COVID vaccinations. Next point is we should lead with the science. We keep saying that, but we don't. We've got well-meaning elected officials and other people who have no expertise in health communications, behavioral economics, et cetera, making these decisions and doing a lot of this work. And as my colleagues have already said, the next point is we need community voice participation and engagement in the process. If you wanna know what's gonna motivate and inspire or encourage somebody to get vaccinated, ask them. And the last point, is it is absolutely critical, I believe, in our Partnering for Vaccine Equity initiative that we document how COVID vaccines are being deployed in our work, including the contextual factors. And that includes everything from what uh, groups we're targeting, who's doing the messaging, what the messaging is, what is the landscape in your community, what were your pre-existing vaccination rates, what do vaccinations look like for other adult and childhood vaccines. What I find really puzzling is that we've got so many people who have gotten every other adult vaccine but refuse to get the COVID vaccine. Or we've got parents that have fully vaccinated their children for everything, but refuse to get them um, the COVID vaccine, even if it's mandated for them to go to school. So the opportunity that I think is before us is to really build that evidence base for the what and the how of how to implement COVID specific vaccine incentives powerfully and effectively. And that's it for me. Thank you all so much. What a fascinating conversation. And um, it was great to hear all your perspectives. Um, we have a couple questions, a, a very active chat, which is really exciting, a couple questions in the Q&A. And the first question in the Q&A actually builds on Dr. Froholden's last point about uh, building the evidence base. And so it would be great if you all might want to speak to how, um, to Aaron's question, should we be incorporating some type of survey for people who come in to get their vaccines about if they were hesitant prior to the present visit and what changed their mind? Can we stop the screen share so we can all see each other? 
Yeah. You know, I, I think some of that, um, I saw that question and I was listening to what Dr. Furholden was talking about. You know, sort of the easy answer I think is more data is always better. But in the chat, there have been some really great um, conversations here about communities where, where people did like the incentives and they did want something. So, you know, I think she, it would be great to know that. It would be great to be able to ask our communities, you know, but I mean, we're already pretty far into this. And I guess that sort of goes to what, what I was wondering too, and I was trying to put in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Furholden, Fer if the slope didn't change, then who's getting the vaccines? Like, are these the people that are likely to have gotten it anyway? And is this one of those things where we need a survey to find that out? Like, if you're gonna ask that, then, you know, what what changed your mind, but also, were you going to get it anyway, whether we, whether we gave you a ten dollar gift card or entered you here's a million dollar lot? Here's, here's the classic example, and and I've done a, my training is in drug and alcohol epi. Nancy Reagan launched the Just Say No campaign, and if you looked at rates of drug use among youth prior to the Just Say No campaign, it was going like this, and then Just Say No happened, and the slope continued. But when they reported on Just Say No, they started where the campaign started and said, see, the slope went down, not acknowledging that the slope was already going down. So that's why it's important to look at the slope, right? Because if the incentives were actually increasing vaccination rates, you would expect to see it go from this to it would change, right? And so, and I'm not saying that people didn't benefit from them. Because some basic things like what a lot of people I heard from in healthcare were, I would love to get a paid COVID vaccination day off. I watch colleagues get vaccinated, spike a fever, be sort of slow on their feet. And I don't want to have to take care of patients feeling like that. And I know, Tracy, this is one of the points that you made. That's a great incentive yeah. for people. You know, well, some of those- It's in the things. chat, you know, like maybe that's where those gift cards are coming in. If you don't have paid time off and you lose money, if you go- get your vaccine because you can't work, then maybe, you know, I wonder how those things interact and, and if we could look at some of that, how it's interacting. Well, and, and that's a very big factor too. If people are, if for people for whom finances are tight, you know, we may say, oh, they're just missing an hour or two of work, but that's sometimes the difference between somebody paying their bills or not. And so if there's nothing making up for that opportunity cost, people are just forced to deal with the potential risk versus I'm going to be late on my rent and get a bill for that. Another uh, issue that was raised in the chat was whether any of the evidence shows any differences by income. So to your point, Mike, whether um, you've seen any evidence on how uh, different subgroups of the population respond to incentives, if you want to speak to that, anyone? Um, I did want to mention, you know, people are asking for some of the data and some of the stats. So we did put the um, I know each of us had some references, and if people are going to be able to access this, these PowerPoints or the larger PowerPoint, then they should be able to, to look at some of those, and, um, and, we'll, and we can put some more links. Thank you, whoever's posting all these links. People are renamed, I guess, and so I, I, I'm guessing that's actually Elizabeth Ryan, but thank you to the people posting those links. So Jenny, I think, uh, you know, part of the question too, then in terms of, um, you know, differences by income, I think that's part of why, you know, in my mind, as we were looking at, there's a need for additional data. I think also some specific things like discrete choice experiments that we can look at, because I think that's the challenge. You know, we would have certain expectations with it, but I'll just kind of take some of the, take some of the stories we had here today. I mean, we could say, well, okay, maybe we think people who are more, financially vulnerable would be more responsive to this because it helps to make up for some of the barriers and things like that. But what if that same audience is not our vaccine hesitant, but the vaccine no group? So then th that's part of what I think is still being identified is what do we know about some of these groups, the vaccine no versus the vaccine hesitant, um, and really starting to get to those differences there for it. So I think there's a little bit, I think we still have some more questions to try and ask. And I think a lot of us are trying to figure out how we best position this. So we know for sure there's probably a place for them in here. We're all suggesting that there's 
there's stuff incentives to play are you know can play a really great role when used effectively but this is there's some unique conditions here that are making it you know not just as cookie cutter as people would like it to be um, because of some of these um things that are coming into play from identity and such like that too uh, is just one of the challenges. I think we have a great opportunity before us to do some of that, ask some of those questions, right? Because specifically for our, um, you know, group of, of folks under 2113, you know, our goal is to develop and, and document these, these promising practices and to develop these toolkits that other communities can use um, to you know, improve adult vaccine equity. And so I think the idea that if we use some of these you know, varying approaches and they should be very contextually relevant and community driven and all of that, we could actually help to build that evidence base for who and how and under what conditions you know, these vaccine incentives really work the best. Um, I want to respond to something that just came in. This is so we've been having some naming problems of people logging in. So uh, it, I'm not going to, I don't know if it was actually um, the person who posted, but I, this goes back to a question that I posted while Mike was talking that, um, you know, some of these things that, that this person is describing about the swag bags and some of these great things that everyone should have, there's not enough hand sanitizer in the world right now. So, you know, giving that out is always a great swag. But, you know, and this, uh, someone's talking about spinning the wheel and answering a question. To me, that sounds like, what, so when I went to get my vaccine at the beginning, there were, <laughs> there were people with pom-poms and every time someone got a shot, uh, they were hoarse by the end of the afternoon, right? But they were like, yeah, way to go. And, and so a lot of this, some of what we're talking about is turning it into a fun atmosphere and rewarding that behavior, celebrating the behavior of, uh, coming in, or even if you come with somebody and sort of celebrating that. Mm -hmm. And some of what we're talking about is an incentive, which is what my colleagues were both talking about, that some of the, some communities, in some communities, it's viewed as a bribe. And I've heard in some communities of, well, wait a minute, why would I trust the CDC? And, and um, there was someone talking about magnetism and trying to stick a magnet to where she'd gotten shot. And, and saying, well, now you want to give me $25 to do this? Why? What's going on with the shot that you need to pay me to do this, right? So, I mean, I think those things are important and we need to hear that. And again, you know, we can't lump all these people together, right? We do that when we look at data, you know, under vaccinated and access. Is it access? Is it transportation? Is it time off? Is it, is it what, right? Or is it, I'm scared. And there's some really bad information out there. We've been talking about this ad nauseum for a year now, right? And people get bad information and they come by it honestly. And um, I, had, I have a private practice and in my private practice, I had a Cuban family who had um, brought their questions to their primary care, which is what we tell people to do. And the primary care doctor had kind of blown them off and they felt like they had been shamed for not getting that vaccine. And, and so they'd sort of been scolded and yelled at and, oh, you should get this vaccine and what's wrong with you? Why are you listening to that? But they're minister had told them, uh, had given them some bad information and shared some information that I thought was being helpful. So, you know, she and I had a conversation about this. I'm a mental health practitioner. I'm not a physician. We had a conversation about this and looking up sources together and talking about what the fears were. And, and that changed her mind a little bit. But at that point, that whole family said, you know what, I'm not getting that because the doctor pissed us off and, and had dismissed their concerns and, and they were ashamed. So, you know, these things are happening all the time. It happens, it happens more often than we would like to admit. And so I think those things are really important for us to recognize and to meet people where they are and not dismiss those concerns. I someone someone just questions. posted a really interesting point. This, so what are your thoughts on incentives and personal liberties? Um, which I think goes into that same thing of incentives and rewards, right? I don't know if you all have a comment on, on that. <laughs> it's an interesting point. I don't have a scientific point of view. I will say I do think I have more of an ethical concern about some of these incentives and even some of the things that people are saying, you know, and I don't, I kind of want to be a bit agnostic about it and say, 
just because people like the incentive or it made people feel good, that's a little bit different from it was effective at in, right. in proving, you know, uh, COVID vaccination rates or vaccine equity. I, I would really like to see us put that, you know, put a bar on ourselves to be able to really, you know, demonstrate that and build the science base around it. Because guess what? This is something that we're going to be dealing with for a long time. But I do have a question about the ethical consideration around dangling a large carrot in front of people for whom, you know, we have in, in human yeah. subjects research, there are, I'm, you know, oftentimes can't give somebody yeah. more than about 20 bucks. Right. Right. Because it's viewed as coercion or, you know, something other than and compensating them, you know, for their time. And so if you were to offer people five hundred dollars, you know, there are a lot of people for whom five hundred dollars would be transformative for their family. You know, I mean, and so, you know, there's some real, you know, issues there that I think we've got to, you know, sort of tease out. And again, if it's community participatory, then communities should be able to chime in. Because if communities have those, that many dire subsistence needs, is the way to do yeah. it to link it to vaccination? Is that sort of the most humanist approach? Yeah, and, and I, I, I want to add on that. As many shots in arms as possible. The public health person in me wants as many shots in arms right. as possible, <laughs> right? Like, so let me just make that super duper clear. I want everybody to get vaccinated. So I wanted to address that point about the incentives and personal liberties. And, and I'm going to be real clear here that I'm speaking for myself, not for the CDC sponsors, not for my colleagues, not for my employer, right? I just want to speak to this as a scholar and a researcher and a clinician. I, I think, right, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of what's going on and a lot of the reason that becomes a big, big conversation is because of the rhetoric that's been happening uh, and the polarization that's related to to politics right now. The truth is that when we talk about public health and you know, when, if you go back to look at the polio vaccine where people were lining up their children, they, they give shots to every kid in every school. Right. This was right. not a debate, right? People did it and, and we were saving lives because you were seeing children dying in front of you. Some of what's happening is people are getting different views of what the evidence says and what, they're, what the science says. The truth is the science doesn't care what our politics are. Right, but how we are presenting that and where it's presented and the spin that's put on it is affecting, you know, we're in a different communications era and that is affecting everything around us. And so a lot of, um, I see that, thank you, Jenny. A lot of, I think what's happening when we talk about personal liberties is it's become a different kind of argument, right? And the, the argument is really about individualistic freedom. And, and again, as was pointed out earlier, some families will get every single shot for their kids, right? Folks coming out of the military, they don't get a choice in their vaccines. They, they go down the line, they get every single vaccine and they've all gotten anthrax whether they wanted it or not, right? So this comes up as, as an issue and yet uh, a lot of it is influenced by this. And so it's really not about personal liberties. It's about how we are engaging in this dialogue nationally and whether or not, you know, this issue of, of herd immunity and whether, you know, how you view this as an issue versus you know, taking care of your community, taking care of each other, um, taking, you know, making sure that we all have the opportunity for access to this and to, to live healthy lives, as opposed to what is my personal freedom to be able to get it, because there's a, there's a, there's a, a problem with the messaging that it's not just about me and whether I get it. It's about every kid that I see in the farm worker community when I go out there. It's about every single person in my community, right? If that makes sense. And thank you for the folks who've been posting some great stuff going on out there. That's a great conversation. Oh, I wish this could go on for hours. This is fascinating. Thank you all so much. Uh, before we wrap it up, uh, we do have a quick poll, if you don't mind answering that. And I uh, just wanted to let all of our community members know about these upcoming events. Um, this has been really, really interesting. I can't thank all of our speakers enough for joining us today. I'd like to thank my Urban Institute colleagues as well. And for all of you in the learning community for joining us. And uh, once again, thanks so much to our speakers. This has just been great. Thanks all, have a great day. Can you leave this for a second so people are, are responding to things and not. Thank you guys so much. Nice to see you guys live. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.